Welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 234, and this is a special episode in which I'm going to focus on seven things that you need to know or you should probably think about when you're collecting reggae on vinyl. And in the video, I'm going to focus on what I think is the greatest period in Jamaican music between the early 1960s and the mid 1980s. Now, obviously, lots of great reggae since then. I'm not in any way disparaging that, but it's not as hard to find in good condition as the older stuff, so it's not that tricky when you're when you're collecting it. It's also largely released digitally as well, which is, as you know, not the focus of this channel. And so this video is really focused on the classic period of reggae on vinyl and slightly before. So beginning with ska and rocksteady in the 1960s, and then roots reggae, lovers rock, dub and toasting in the 1970s, and then moving a little bit into the 1980s with dancehall and sing -jing. And the video is very much directed to people who are starting out collecting reggae. It's not intended for reggae experts, those who already have a great library of this excellent music. Now, I know a lot of those folks will watch anyway, and thank you for watching. And if you have things that you think I've slightly misconstrued, then please do leave a comment. Love the support, love the feedback. Nobody knows all about this stuff, least of all me. No, mainly this is for the person just starting out, because amongst other reasons, Collecting reggae can actually be kind of expensive, and if you don't really know what you're doing, and if you haven't learned from experience, you can spend decent money on things that aren't so great. The days of inheriting other people's cast-off collections, your older brother's stuff, because he moved to listening to CDs and so on, are largely gone. You can't find much in thrift stores anymore. So really, it's about doing your research these days, and I hope this video is gonna help. So what I'm gonna do is talk about seven different things that will maybe help you understand the genre and give you a bit of a strategy. And those are, first of all, how reggae evolved historically. Secondly, the influence of Rastafari and what that does and does not have to do with reggae. Uh, the main styles of reggae. There's also a section which I call What About Bob? about the preeminent position of Bob Marley in people's imagination, but what reggae is. Also talking about the producers that are the most significant producers in reggae, or at least some of them anyway, in their labels. Talk a little bit about quality control, which is pretty important if you're buying reggae on vinyl. And finally, a little bit about formats, singles, compilations, albums, and so on. I'm not going to use music clips because I want to stay clear of any copyright issues, but I will make a clear note about all the music I mentioned, and it'll all be listed as well as you'll see in the description below. So here we go. Hope you like it. And if you do, please do like it. Please leave a comment and please do subscribe and click that little bell to get reminded when new content comes up. When thinking about where reggae comes from, a lot of it, like a lot of music, is actually due to historical happenstance. In the case of reggae, about the history of Jamaica, the fact that it was first colonized by the Spanish, it was then colonized by the English over a period of some 400, 450 years. The original indigenous population is either killed or assimilated by the Spanish and then by the English. And the island is then repopulated with a workforce of slaves from West Africa. And the connection to West Africa for reggae music, just as it is in Cuba for the emergence of Afro-Cuban music, is the foundation of it all. Without the African connection, there's nothing there. Other important social and political aspects of history which are important for reggae in the 20th century include the anti-colonial movement, which starts to start up all over the world in colonized countries in the early part of the 20th century. Gandhi and Sun Yat-sen and in Jamaica, a very comparable figure, and somebody who was very much focused on pan-Africanism was Marcus Garvey, who was Jamaican very active in politics in the U.S. as well, and it turns out to be very influential in the development of Rastafari down the line. In terms of musical influences on reggae, in the early part of the 20th century, Calypso was the big thing, largely emanating from Trinidad. Jamaica had its own version of this called Mento, and if you want a good example, give a listen to the 1958 album by the Island Champions called Silver Seas Calypso, which despite the name is actually not a Calypso record, it's a Mento record. And listening to that, it's not a big stretch to see where the beat and the pace of the music which became reggae ultimately comes from. World War II also has a big influence, as it does on music all over the world in different kinds of ways. And in Jamaica, it has an influence because U.S. troops are stationed there during the war. In addition to their own selves and their military equipment, they bring records, jazz records, they bring R&B records, they have their own radio stations. And Jamaicans, for the first time, are exposed in particular to R&B. And it really catches on like wildfire, basically. And in the post-war years, from say 45 to 55, the big thing in terms of public popular music in Jamaica were street parties run by sound system operators because, of course, not a lot of people had electricity. And so if you had a truck with a generator and big speakers, you could drive it and set up a party. People would come and dance. And the records which everybody wanted to hear were the latest R&B records. 
After the Americans departed, the influence of R&B starts to wane, or at least the availability of R&B records starts to wane. And so the sound system operators, some of them anyway, begin to migrate to becoming producers, and they start to focus on producing well, originally Jamaican versions of R&B, but very quickly that's blended with Jamaican musical traditions, and you start to get some really vibrant and exciting stuff happening. As the country moves towards independence in 1962, there's an awful lot of ferment of all kinds, intellectual, social, musical, psychological, you name it. Out of all this ferment, in the early 1960s comes this distinctively Jamaican music, which is the first style that really fits within the general category of reggae, although of course it's not reggae, talking about ska, and ska is really in its heyday from 1962 to about 1966. Ska, of course, is a very distinctive style of music. It's got that notable one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two kind of beat. On the upbeat, you've got either a piano chord or brass instruments or guitar chord sometimes playing that distinctive skank. And some really good examples of this are Enjoy Yourself by Prince Buster or Simmer Down by The Wailers, Bob Marley and Peter Tosh and Bunny Wailer in their earliest incarnation or pretty much anything uh, by the great uh, trombone player Don Drummond from that particular era. And uh, ska basically takes over Jamaica's dance floors for about a four-year period. But things are changing quite quickly, and recording techniques are getting more sophisticated, just as the music is getting more sophisticated. And ska in the mid-1960s is then replaced by a short-lived, but very influential, and frankly, really great style of music called Rocksteady. And Rocksteady is... The differences are subtle, I guess, but it relies less on brass, it relies more on the bass, it's slower, usually, not always, but usually slower than ska, and often a little bit edgier in terms of the musical composition, but also the themes. And some great examples of Rocksteady are the song Rocksteady by Alton Ellis, which actually gave the style its name, and my personal favorite, Stop That Train by Keith and Tex, which also kind of foreshadows reggae, I think. It's tricky to tell the difference sometimes between what's ska, what's rocksteady, and what's reggae, and you'll often get them compiled, the same record under one of those particular names, and in truth, the lines are pretty fuzzy between the three of them. That's in terms of the music, but in terms of the focus and the lyrical themes, there is actually quite a distinct evolution from ska, which was very poppy, concerned with love and dancing and those kinds of themes, Rocksteady, a little bit edgier. Reggae is a whole other evolution in focus, political focus, social consciousness. Musically, the differences between Rocksteady and Reggae, again, not all the time, but most of the time, are three. First of all, Reggae is slowed down even more than Rocksteady, typically. Secondly, the bass lines are typically a lot more complex, and you also have more complex rhythms to the guitar. You don't just have a single skank, you might have a double or a triple skank, and sometimes you have that accompanied by an organ, so there's more musical complexity. And the bass is also typically even higher in the mix than it was in Rocksteady, and it was higher in the mix in Rocksteady than it was in Ska. And part of that simply has to do with the advances in recording technology, just like rock and roll records from the 50s sound a lot tinnier than rock and roll records from 1970. But the differences in musical style are almost less important when it comes to the emergence of full-on reggae than are the differences in focus and lyrical content. Because reggae is largely a reaction, in many ways, to social and political events. I mentioned that Jamaica becomes independent in 1962. That's a period of great optimism, and that's kind of reflected in the happy-go-lucky sounds of ska. But by the late 60s, that optimism, as in other parts of the world, had been replaced by pessimism. All the promise of independence and liberation and social equality seems to have dissipated. Looking around, black Jamaicans still saw themselves as being poor. They still saw white and light-skinned Jamaicans holding most of the positions of power. They still saw themselves being repressed by the police and by economic circumstances. More broadly, the forces of anti-colonialism, anti-capitalism, pan-Africanism are sweeping through people's consciousness. On top of that, you begin to get the influence of Rastafari, which I'll talk about in a bit. So by 1970, reggae had emerged as a dominant musical style in Jamaica and would stay there for many, many years. That said, there's not really a clean break always between these eras. In fact, in the 1970s, you can still find people who are largely performing Jamaicanized versions of R&B hits. People like John Holt and Ken Booth are good examples of that. So let's talk about Rastafari. And the first thing I should say is I'm not a believer. 
I am interested in Rastafari, very interested, but only because of its role as a muse for some of the greatest music ever recorded. I personally don't think it's any more or less reasonable to believe in this than it is to believe in any of the Abrahamic religions. I actually think Rastafari is a little less unpleasantly weird about food and sex, but this is not a discussion of theology or any kind of value judgment. To understand Rastafari and to understand a lot of reggae lyrics helps to go back to think again about Marcus Garvey, who was this Jamaican political figure and thinker in the early part of the 20th century, he spent a lot of his time in the States as well. Uh, he was a Pan-Africanist, so he was addressing his thinking to the broader diaspora of former African slaves in the Western Hemisphere in particular. He was very vocal in back to Africa thinking. He was also very interested at times in the separation of black people from white people for the benefit of black people, obviously. And this leads him to be somewhat controversial because at certain times, strange bedfellows, he ends up getting to bed a bit with the KKK, who obviously also are segregationists of a different kind. But in general, his influence in terms of consciousness, self-confidence, and vision politically in Jamaica is very, very positive. He's a national hero in Jamaica. The principal thing that Rastas associate with Marcus Garvey, which of course he borrowed from several books of the Bible, is this prophecy that a black king would be crowned as a messiah in Africa. He starts talking about this in the 1920s. In 1930, Haile Selassie is crowned emperor of Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia is relevant for other reasons, and there's all kinds of reggae bands called the Abyssinians and the Ethiopians and so on, because Ethiopia was a symbol of defiance and resistance to European colonialism. Ethiopia has a very long and well-documented history, which is a great antidote to white Europeans attempt basically to erase black history and impose their own history in the continent. And so the confluence of these factors, the relevance of Ethiopia and Haile Selassie ascending the throne in that country, lead a lot of people in Jamaica to conclude, okay, the time is now, the Messiah is here, and Haile Selassie is the Messiah walking on earth. And regarding the name, Haile Selassie was his name as emperor, but his name when he was a prince was Rastafari Makonan, or Rastafari Prince Tafari, hence the borrowing of that name for the name of the movement. In the first decade after Selassie comes to power, Rastafari thought develops at a modest pace, but it really takes off after World War II as Jamaica gets closer and closer to actual independence. And in that period, alternatives to Western systems of thought and belief become more and more attractive to people opposed to colonialism. And then it really booms the influence of Rastafari when Selassie himself visits Jamaica after independence in 1966. As the 60s wore on and social conditions worsened in Jamaica after independence, politically conscious Jamaican music and Rasta philosophy merged and they found their voice. And they didn't find their voice in the R&B and soul influenced music of ska and rock steady. They found it in the newer form of reggae, which was slower, which was more musically complex, which was more spiritual and which became much more consciously black music. There's a new consciousness, a new pride, and this starts to manifest itself in one of the most distinctive aspects of reggae compared to the other styles, which was the use of very distinctively Jamaican accents and singing. No longer were people trying to sound like Sam Cooke or other contemporary R&B stars, they sounded like Jamaicans. An example of this early reggae with its heavy political, spiritual content would be pretty much anything that Whalers put out, so the 69, 70, 71, thereabouts. There's a compilation called African Herbsman, which is a compilation of things the Whalers did, produced by Lee Perry around 1970, which is excellent anyway. It has a bunch of different covers. This is the one I have. That's a great example of pretty much anything by Burning Spear from this time. This is, these are a couple of his albums from then are examples of this style, and this style is known as roots reggae, heavy spiritual, heavy political content. It was a dominant style in reggae for over a decade, but it's not the only style. As I mentioned, roots reggae artists were almost always concerned with political or spiritual or social issues, not always, but most of the time. But there were lots of other styles, in particular, love songs, which of course, have never gone away from music for very long, and a major strand of the reggae tradition in the 1970s which features love songs almost exclusively is what was known as, unsurprisingly, Lover's Rock. Pretty much anything, for instance, by Gregory Isaacs would count as Lover's Rock, or, for that matter, almost anything by uh, Ken Booth. Uh, here's another well-loved record cover, although the vinyl in here is actually pristine, strangely enough. Uh, he's got a cover of Everything I Own, on here uh, by Bread and a bunch of other uh, 
very soulful contemporary covers, nothing political or social in there, or very little, largely just a focus on making out. Another reggae style which has its antecedents in the 1960s but really takes off in the 1970s is toasting. A toasting is where you've got a DJ who is chatting or chanting or yelling or rhyming or just generally carrying on over top of another piece of music. Now this could either be, as it was originally, someone else's hit single or it could be an instrumental track and producers would often create multiple versions of a single, some with no vocals, so that DJs could toast over top. I mentioned the roots of toasting being in the 60s, actually it goes back to the 50s and all those sound system parties with the R&B records and so on. But by the late 1960s, it starts to emerge as a genuine art form in and of itself. And so you've got artists like Big Youth and, but later on, Uroy, enjoying himself, and one of my favorite records by uh, one of my favorite reggae names, Dennis Al Capone. And so you have this whole explosion of these toasting DJs. But maybe the best known toasting track occurs on this record, which is a soundtrack to The Harder They Come a Jamaican feature film from 1971, and the track is Draw Your Breaks by the DJ Scotty, who is toasting over top of Keith and Tex's song Stop That Train. Phenomenal track, phenomenal record, actually mostly rock steady on here. Uh, anyway, the toasting phenomenon had created this market for producers to create instrumental tracks, sometimes in their own right, sometimes by stripping out the vocals, and this technique, never mind the DJ toasting stuff, began to get its own following, these largely instrumental tracks, and they became known as dub, which is another major style of reggae in the 1970s. The dub producers would drop out the vocal tracks, they would drop or accent other instruments, they'd work the sliders during the song, they'd add strange sound effects. Dub music is a deep dive into reggae. It is, I would argue, for serious reggae fans. It is the least accessible subgenre of reggae because it's out there in terms of production. There's tons of good dub, there's tons of bad dub. A great place to start with dub would be almost anything by King Tubby or later on in the 1980s by Scientist in particular. Uh, there's one album called The Best Dub Album in the World, which is pretty close to being the best dub album in the world. I'll mention two more of the major styles of reggae which still fit into my time frame here of the 60s to the mid 1980s. One of those is Dance Hall which is an evolution of toasting, although the music tends to be original rather than just dub versions of other tracks. It has lots in common with early hip hop, both in terms of rhyming over a fairly spare musical accompaniment, but also very similar in terms of lyrical themes, gangsters, guns, drugs, street life, a lot of bragging, and both styles of music, both hip hop and dance hall, managed to upset the same kinds of people. Lots of great dance hall. It became pretty much the dominant style of reggae by the mid to late 1980s. My personal favorite is a guy called Yellow Man, who uh, has a whole bunch of records actually, and this one has the classic track Jamaica Nice, which uh, I would recommend as an example of dance hall. And then the final style that I'll mention is Sing Jang, which is kind of a halfway house between singing and toasting. It's often sung in a very quirky and nasal way. It's quite tricky for my Canadian ears sometimes to understand. The Black Uhuru singer Michael Rose often sings in this way, although I wouldn't generally call Black Uhuru sing J music. The best example I can think of is actually Ike Mouse, and well, pretty much anything by Ike Mouse, but any track off his record, 1984, it's a great record, Mouseketeer, is a good example of sing J. Bob Marley is the default name in reggae for people who don't know a ton about reggae. And there are good reasons for this, because he's very talented, and he wrote some incredible songs. He had a long career, died tragically young, very influential, uh, a lot of political and social integrity to the guy as well. So a lot of good reasons why he's famous. But if you assume that he's the gold standard for reggae and everything else falls away, you're missing, I would argue, probably most of the good stuff and certainly most of the good root stuff. So why is this? Well, this is where the white record industry comes in. Most reggae fans worldwide, casual ones anyway, came to know Bob Marley not in his heyday in the 1970s, but in 1984 with the release of this record, Legend, which is a compilation released by Island Records, Posthumous Greatest Hits, which is the single biggest selling reggae record of all time and the 41st best selling record of any kind all time. It contains mostly Bob Marley's love songs. The revolutionary stuff, of which he wrote and recorded a lot, gets very little space. Why? Well, because the boss of Island Records, Chris Blackwell, 
felt implicitly or explicitly that Bob's criticism of colonialism and white racism wasn't going to sell to a global audience and a wealthy white audience. So he packages Bob as a safe singer of lovely crooning love songs. And that's not the only time the Island Records made a decision like that. The original Whalers stayed together, Bob Marley, Bonnie Whaler, and Peter Tosh, until 1973 when they split over a variety of creative differences. Island Records at that time backed Bob Marley at the expense of Bunny Whaler, who was by far the most devout Rasta, and at the expense of Peter Tosh, who was the most explicitly political of the three artists. So, Bob Marley's album, Natty Dread, comes out in 1974, but it takes Bunny and Peter another two years for their records to see the light of day. Uh, Peter Tosh's debut is Legalize It, and this comes out in 1976. Similarly, Bunny Whaler's Black Heart Man comes out in 1976 as well. It's also a bit of a bone of contention, I don't know how much stock you put in this, that Island Records chose to market the lighter skinned, mixed race, safer seeming Marley as the face of reggae they were gonna promote, and Bunny the Hardcore Rasta and Political Peter end up getting marginalized, and Peter actually ends up going to another label, and Bunny definitely becomes a second stringer on Island. Now, none of this is meant to suggest that Bob Marley was a sellout or lacked musical talent. Nothing could be further from the truth. He's one of the great musicians of the 20th century. He had integrity throughout his whole life. But you just need to be aware that his supposed position as head and shoulders, the most talented reggae artist ever to have lived, owes as much to Chris Blackwell's marketing ideas in the 1970s as it does, and 1980s as it does to what's available to listen to on record. Is he the best reggae artist overall? Well, he's up there. Is he the best roots reggae artist? Well, I don't know. I actually think you could make a pretty good case for Burning Spear, amongst others. So the bottom line is, enjoy Bob, but don't forget for a moment that there is a ton of amazing roots music out there, a lot of it as good or sometimes better than the Waiters catalog, and a lot less overplayed. I talked earlier about the guys who ran the sound systems in the streets of Jamaica in the 1950s, and when those US R&B records dried up and they began to focus on a more distinctly Jamaican sound, some of those sound system operators become some of the most popular producers, and they become in turn amongst the most famous names in reggae, and these include people like Duke Reed, who founded Treasure Isle Records and handled many of the great singing groups, particularly in the 1960s, like the Paragons, who did the original version of The Tide is High, which you can find on this record on the beach, which Blondie of course covered in 1979. And I should also mention Cox and Dodd. Here he is, who founded the famous Studio One, and this is the first black owned studio in Jamaica, dominant position in the 1960s in the ska and rock steady scenes, fades a little bit, but still present in the 1970s. Now, Cox and Dodd had an employee called Lee Perry, um, who used to uh, sell records for him, and then left Studio One in the mid-1960s. Big personality, weird guy, actually sadly just died recently, fell out with almost every major music industry person in Jamaica in the middle to late 1960s. Calls himself the Upsetter because he upset so many people. Um, has a house band called the Upsetters and they produce all kinds of great early tracks for DJs to toast over but also as early dub. He also recorded the Wailers in their most dynamic period around 6970 when their new roots reggae sound was coming together and when the Wailers split in 1973, Bob Marley takes most of the Upsetters band and turns them into the new Wailers backing band. Perry continues on despite this. He forms Black Art Studios and they produce some, well, incredible roots reggae, but also some of the most amazing dub records of the late 1970s. Then he actually burns the studio to the ground and eventually moves to Switzerland. There are lots of great producers, lots of good labels. It's kind of hard to list them all. You kind of have to get your feet wet and figure out what you like. But it's fairly safe to say that most things you find, say in the 60s on Studio One or Treasure Isle, will be worth collecting. Anything on Black Ark in the 1970s is great. Lots of other labels as well, so you have to do your research. But there is a caveat to that, which I'll mention in a second. There are also several well-known foreign labels, typically English labels, which specialize in reggae. They tend to have better financial backing because they're not in a developing country at the time. Better equipment, not necessarily better sound because the Jamaican studios were committed to that deep groove, deep bass, reggae sound, which sometimes gets somehow filtered down or filtered away in some of the English releases or releases dominated by international labels. 
The best example of this is what happens to Bernie Spears' album, Marcus Garvey, remember him? So this is the original Jamaican mix. And what happens is when Island Records hears this, they decide, oh, there's too much bass, this is too threatening a mix, so we're actually gonna create a different mix. So the record which gets released to the world as Marcus Garvey is this one, which it sounds really good, to be clear, but doesn't sound nearly as good as the one I just had in my hands, the original Jamaican mix, which is mind-blowingly good. This is the one which is the international release and most people haven't actually heard the other one. I highly recommend it if you can. All I have to say, I've come to have a lot more faith in Jamaican labels than in better funded, better financed, better distributed international labels. Uh, for me, like I love Peter Tosh's music, but I think between them, Island and Columbia and Rolling Stones records did a ton to mess up his catalog. Frankly, I think through shitty mixes, to be candid, really never do like the way uh, his records sound, although I love the songs. In fairness to Island, they actually do a pretty good job on some other canonical Roots Reggae releases, like, for instance, uh, I Jaw Man's early work, which is amazing. There are some more consistently good UK-based labels, like Brown Nation and Greensleeves. Production from those is typically peerless. Trojan, very well-known label out of the UK, specializing in reggae, specializing particularly in the late 60s, early 70s, in re-releasing and distributing original Jamaican releases for a UK audience. Given the scarcity of original releases in recent years, there's a whole bunch of reissues that started to happen of classic reggae records that you know, typically you couldn't find for less than 500 bucks in an original version. And specialty reissue labels have popped up. And here you need to be very careful what you buy. There are some good reissue labels. Blood and Fire in particular almost never puts a foot wrong sometimes, but, but not usually. But there is a lot of bad stuff out there, and this matters. It matters a lot when you're listening to reggae, because if you're like me, what you love about reggae is that deep, rich bass sound and just that generally warm manner of production that is typical of the Jamaican labels. And I don't want something which sounds pristine, but doesn't have that oomph, that kind of body feel when you're listening to it. I want those reggae endorphins. And much of the reissued stuff is deceptively packaged. It looks like the old records. Sometimes they even copy the kind of amateurish looking labels that would have been used in the 60s and 70s with lots of flaws on them. You have to look really, really carefully. I have about 2,000 records in my collection. A lot of jazz, a lot of rock, some Latin, bossa nova, reggae. It is very, very rare that I feel the need to buy a different release of a jazz or a rock record because the quality of the sound is not up to it and I want to go back and get an earlier release. With reggae records, unfortunately, that's much more common, which is why it's so important to do the research. I often find, at the end of the day, it's been more worth my while to spend the money on an earlier pressing than get something which looks shiny and flash and heavily packaged and lots of, you know, of uh, outtakes and additional colored LPs and all the rest of it. Those re-releases often look beautiful but sound very disappointing. And this also applies to original labels who much later on are reissuing their old material. And all of this is complicated by... Because when you do get your hands on vintage Jamaican vinyl, there are a whole other set of issues which are going to crop up. First of all, the vinyl itself is often a bit dodgy. As often it was melted down and reused, you'll get these little dimply things. They aren't as bad as they look sometimes. Sometimes the record will play through, but these aren't going to be records that look like the typical records that you buy. They will also often have other physical issues, like having the spindle hole not quite centered so the record oscillates somewhat. Or, this is one which drives me crazy, but it happens more often than you'd think. Uh, having, uh, this is uh, Marsha Griffith's uh, solo album after she no longer recorded as part of Marsha and Bob, but before she became a member of the I-3s with Bob Marley. This is her debut um, as a solo artist. And the thing that is crazy about this, you can't, I don't know if you can quite see it, the paper label is very close to the last uh, grooves of the last song. And so what happens is your needle ends up running onto the paper label and running over the label, which is not a happy time for the needle or for you. So you have to be uh, very, very careful. Then of course, there's a bunch of other minor things like misspellings, mislabelings, side one is actually side two. Actually, I find that stuff kind of funny and charming, sort of was part of the whole scene because it was 
such a shoestring set of operations. So the bottom line is, if you're interested in buying a record, don't just buy a cheap version of the album that's rated very good plus or near mint or whatever. Research the pressing. Research the pressing. And it's quite easy to do on Discogs. If the pressing is bad, people will have said so in the comments in that particular release. If you find a good one, buy it. And never mind the cover condition. You've seen there's some crappy covers amongst the records I've got there, but the sound of the music on those records is fantastic. The well-loved cover, think of it just as an endorsement of love from past generations. The last thing I want to mention is format, by which I mean, should you be buying singles or LPs or compilations when it comes to reggae? There's a pretty simple rule here. From the 1970s on, LPs are a safe bet. They're the way to go. Uh, this is later than for other styles of music, but it's really in the 1970s that the LP becomes a default means of release in reggae, in Jamaican music. It's the standard for roots reggae, it's the standard for dub, it's the standard for lovers rock, and so on. Almost everything that's released up until 1969, the single is the main thing. And albums, except for the best established artists like the Paragons or the Heptones, were basically an inconsistent afterthought. There are some good records out there, LP records, but for the most part, artists were singles artists. That goes for the Whalers, and that goes for all kinds of people who were really active uh, in the 1960s. So you're better off, way better off, if you're collecting ska and rock steady and collecting singles or compilations. And compilations are tricky because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of compilations of Jamaican music that was released between, say, 1960 and 1971, 1972. And these compilations are of variable quality, particularly in terms of the track listing. There are some pretty reliable compilations released on some of the better known labels like Studio One or Trojan, who are probably the biggest producer of high quality compilations in a variety of different formats in the last 20 years or so. This is a great one, uh, which has a ton of rock steady on it in particular. Uh, but even so, you gotta do your research. You have to make sure that you know the songs you want first and then shop for the compilation, I would say, and do your research again on the pressing. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it helps you with your crate digging. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave a note in the comments. Please like it. And please, if you wouldn't mind, subscribe for future content that comes up. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.